What is happening, YouTube? It's Matt Faircloth. Welcome, welcome, welcome to the Mentorship Monday program. So I can't uh, do this alone. I need my co-host, Justin Fraser. Come on in, Justin. Gene, how are you? What's up, Gene? Happy Monday. Happy, Happy Monday. Monday. What can we do for you today, brother? Well, I'll tell you. I feel like I'm talking to Obi-Wan Kenobi himself. <laughs> so let me tell you where I'm at. I'm older than you, Matt. I'm 66. Okay. I'm a retired small business person. All right. And I started buying multifamily houses in 2014 up in Maine. And so we have just over a hundred units now. Mm -hmm. And I've done it all with my own equity, but I've also been watching your videos. And um, I say to myself, how does this young kid go from, you know, 15 units to 60 million in assets? So we're kind of thinking our business plan for the next. And I'm thinking, what is the magic elixir I don't have? So I, I have bought the book. Ah! So I think, <laughs> there are so many different ways to raise capital. Yes. But at 56 years old, that I want the moral responsibility of dealing with uh, so many people. But so my question to you is, you know, how do you go from zero to 60 million and raise basically 25% of that capital? Do you have a billion munchkins in your closet giving you $50,000? <laughs> I want to know how I can manage the growth of my capital base moving forward to expand my operation. Well, first of all, Gene, you, you and I are going to be best friends forever because you called me a kid, and I love that. Uh -huh. Thank you. I uh, thank you. I hope I always I hope I always come off of as a kid as a kid to everybody. Thank you. Um, listen, and I know that there was a lot of compliments woven in there too. So thank you for your kudos as well to our success and and all that. First of all. Uh, you built up a, a, a hundred unit portfolio for yourself of single families and small multis and all that. Okay. All multi family. All multi Got it. Family. How did you do, did you do that through, did you get all that capital through yours? Is all that your money you earned through your business that you parlayed yeah, into real? I'm a retired small business person. Got it. And like many small business people, I bought the building that my plan was in and it was in downtown Miami. And I also bought the surrounding land. So when I cashed out of my business, you know, I had a certain amount of money. So I started buying multifamily units in Maine, you know, and I bought a six unit, then a four unit. Uh, we just closed on two 15 units. But so now I'm looking to say, you know, how do I kick it up a notch? You know, maybe we should sell off some of the small units, reinvest that capital into bigger units. But as I watch a lot of young people like yourself and some of the people that you've interviewed on your, on your show, I just feel like I'm underperforming. Uh, not that I want to uh, uh, see how much of other people's money I can get, but it, you know, how can I do a blended approach maybe? So I'm talking to an insurance company now because insurance companies do loan long-term, but they also joint venture. Uh, we're talking to some wealthy people, but I want to hear you know, the story. I mean, uh, do you just yeah. get on a horse with wings and come back with bags? Yeah. Yeah, it's just trust fund. It's a silver spoon in my mouth. It's 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 all actually it's all actually my money. I don't raise any investors and all that. No, 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 none of that's true. Um, it's a uh, it, it was it's been it's been a long road, uh, Gene, for us. Come on in, Justin. Um, it's been a long road for us, uh, for me anyway, you know, and, and for Justin too. But for me, Gene, I started raising money from investors in 2011. And I did small deals, really small stuff. Like my first, in my first private equity deal was two townhouses, and the guy put in fifty grand, and I get, we did 50-50 split, um, and we just built up from there. And now, yeah, I got a closet full of fit people that will give us fifty thousand dollars, a hundred thousand dollars, and sometimes we get people that will give us, you know, um, my biggest I think equity investments uh, a little over a half million bucks. So you can get folks that will put bigger chunks of change in there to your deal. So that so that's how we did it was by going wide and offering what we want, what we do to a lot of people. That has to do a lot with my beliefs, with with what I believe that real estate investor, real estate investors can do. I think that I mean, again, I don't know if I have it. Uh, I can't reach it. The mantra for my company, the DeRosa Group, is to transform lives through real estate. And I believe that 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 America cannot rely on Wall Street anymore to reach its financial goals. Yeah, Wall Street can be a part of the equation, but should not be the only part of the equation. And and we're seeing transitions happen now, where people are starting to invest more and more in other things. 
we at the DeRosa Group want to help people reach their financial goals. Middle America reach their financial goals through investing in things like real estate syndications. That's our goal as a company. So we're thinking out here, right? But the downside of the downside of doing what we do, which is like the word, the, the Winston Salem deal that you're familiar with, right? right. We're probably going to have, I don't know, what do you think, Justin, 140, 150 investors on that one? You know, yeah, um, yeah. when you do the when yeah. you do the math on right. the amount of money we're raising and what the yeah. average investor puts in, Gene, that's going to add up to be about that. So that's 150 or so cats that I have to herd. Okay. And, and in, let me ask you. So did you go out the deal in the agreement, and now you're going to go get the investors, or it seems you're getting your investors ongoing business? You're really kind of. Yeah, you attract the invest. You're we're having a connectivity issue with you, but I heard what you said. Um, you're uh, we attract the investors first. And now I'm not saying like, okay, I've got eight million dollars worth of dollars or interest or whatever in a deal, and I'm going to go and buy something with that money. What I'm saying is, it would be foolish of me to just get started. And you see this a lot of of just getting started investors to say. I'm going to go buy a hundred unit apartment building. But the problem is they can, it's easy to find a hundred unit apartment building, but it's, it's really hard to find enough people that are willing to trust you to give you money to buy that building. So they end up having to give their soul away to their investors and to, um, and to people to help them get that deal closed, right? You're better off building the database first of people that believe in you and that, and that are willing to get into deals with you. Now, if you've got a hundred units uh, under ownership now, you shouldn't have a problem uh, uh, soliciting and building an investor base. I, I so, have a lot of yeah. My biggest issue, you see a lot of sense, what I like about you. You're very hands on. You know, it's just not trying to get somebody so you can pop 30% managing 30% over it. My problem, again, post World War II 50s guy, is you just don't want the more ability to the investor that selling you the dream, you know, and kind of hang there. Five years later, they're going to say, into my 20%. I'm not selling. You, know, so you might not, you might not want to. I mean, that the thing is, is that uh, you've got to be able to have difficult conversations. I mean, Justin and I have had to have difficult conversations with investors before where, you know, our best laid plans didn't quite come to fruition. And we always have stuck into the deal to make it right. But deals have twists and turns and lefts and rights. And if you don't want to be that guy to have those conversations with investors, say, hey, listen, I told you we were going to get 18%. But it looks more like it's going to be fourteen, you know, um, or even where you read my book, right? So, or like, hey, we just sold this building in Philly, and we we walked out of closing with three quarters of a million dollars. But guess what? It got stolen, you know. Um, to have that, imagine that conversation. Kind of, now you've read that thumb book, right? Unless you did, you read the whole thing yet? I, I, yes, I read a lot. Bottom line, Gene, is that. You got to be able to have really difficult conversations with investors. My point was in the book, I talk about how we had three quarters of a million dollars stolen in, in a Ponzi scheme through through somebody running a Ponzi 1031 exchange company. And we had that stolen. And I had to go to investors and say, this is what happened and this is what I'm going to do about it. You know, I mean, it, it you know, that was, that was a rough day for Matt Faircloth, my friend. It enables you to go wide. It enables you to have a lot of investors that, uh, that are willing to get behind you to go take down big deals like big apartment buildings and stuff like that. But the da the other side of it, Gene, is that you know you're beholden to them. You're a custodian of their money, and it, in in some ways, you know you've got to give up a lot to get a lot. You know, and so I don't know if you have to go there for where you are. You might be better off soliciting one or two larger investors and doing a joint venture, uh, do, which is JV is 100 percent different. Well, I think that that is great. Tell so, us the story of how you built up 100 units. So I was a small business person, like many small business people. I owned a printing company. Hmm. And I was smart enough to buy my building. And at the time, downtown Miami that I was in was a slum. So I bought the whole city block around. Nice. For next to nothing. And the printing industry got destroyed with the internet. And constantly um, uh, reinventing yourself. But... When I was 57, this would have been 2010, my wife at 37 years died. And you sit there and you say, you know, what am I going to do? And so I sold my business and the city of Miami grew up around me. You know, the magic of real estate, they built a performing arts center across the street, a gambling casino concern came in and all of a sudden I made a lot of money. 
And I connected with my high school sweetheart, who I hadn't seen in 40 years. And we bought a property in Maine, a house to live in, a farm. You know, it's like, I'm a tinkerer, like a small business person. I don't play golf. So I bought a six-unit apartment building. And I bought a four-unit. And in Maine, I told everybody it's like $1950. You know, in Miami, everything's so expensive. Everything in Maine, it's like 35000 a unit, 21000 a unit. It was like, holy smokes, I was buying them for cash. And, uh, and it was, they were still coming out of the 2008 recession, so prices were down. And, you know, I just kind of learned it, and I enjoy it. And so the summers and fall, I'm up here, but then I go down to Florida. I have a house in Florida that I stay in. But I just shop deals all the time. You know, I don't, I don't play golf. I, I religiously get on the multiple listings and look. And sometimes people brought me deals. Uh, sometimes the bank brought me a deal. You know, in Maine, there's only a million people. So if you got a quarter of a million dollars in your pocket, it's like, holy smoke, look at this guy. <laughs> Miami, that doesn't get you an outhouse. <laughs> so I bought all along the coast. I own all along the coast in Maine. We just closed. We're closing Wednesday, and I already closed on a 15-unit uh, in Millinocken, which is the end of the Appalachian Trail. It's Baxter State Park. Yeah. And my son is in Charlotte, so I started to encourage him to buy in the Charlotte area. So we got 20 units down there. And so you have the dichotomy, mean you get low price, very high yield, high capitalization rates, old inventory. So you really have to have a good maintenance program. And I buy them not expecting a capital gain. I buy them strictly for the yield, although we have a capital gain on them. Whereas, whereas in North Carolina, as you know, you know, with the population growing the way it is, you know, the price push inflation is going to happen because of all the population. And my son is down there, so I figure we'll start buying there, too. And I just enjoy doing it. I, I watch someone like yourself, and I've always told my son, if you enjoy what you do, you'll never work a day in your life. First of all, I'd keep doing what you've been doing. Okay. I'd keep buying 5, 10, 15, 20 units at a clip. Uh, there's so little competition and there's so few people that know what they're doing in that space. And there's not that many people investing in Maine. So yeah. you've got, you've got to be a kid in a candy shop up there. And that a lot of competition there is, there is not. Oh, there's not. Okay. There's so not. I, I, but I mean, as long as you've got an economy to support the housing for people that need places to live, I would scale out. I mean, what I did was when we got to about 50 units, I scaled out a full property management company underneath the DeRosa group and hired a maintenance tech, an office manager, and a property manager. And then I scaled up to 115 units and was able to feed the three of them. Uh, right. You know, maintenance guy made a salary and I just billed his time to the properties. So that yeah. didn't come out of my pocket. You know, um, that's right. what you need. You need, you need like a 50 year old guy in a pickup truck, you know, well, to I'm take your place. Hire mm -hmm. veteran. That's yeah, technical engineer. That's what I I had a uh, that's what I had. I had, had an engineer guy that that was like a mechanic in a factory and was oh, retired. Yeah. He was a mechanic in a factory, knew how to fix anything. Okay, and I, I just that. and he just plopped himself in a pickup truck and just went around and did work orders. You need an office manager to pay your books and to pay your bills and to run your financials that's, to that's run quick that knows QuickBooks really well. You can start yeah, out with your third party bookkeeper, or they could be your wife, whatever. Um, yeah. And then you need a property manager to handle tenant stuff and to do showings and to chase tenants around for rent, God forbid, if you right. have to do that. And that property manager person talks to the maintenance tech and you, the PM and the maintenance tech become this little trifecta and you'll run it. You're off to the races. I would not try and buy two, 300 unit buildings uh, or do it like we did. There's a hundred different ways you can skin a cat, but you could scale to two to 300 units doing it the in, in bite-sized chunks. Yeah. I, I'll leave you with this idea. It's a little inception, this idea. And I think I'll probably triple your portfolio with this idea, Gene. So you ready? Okay. Here's what you do. You go and take a few of those money guys that you money guys and gals that you have. Um, they need to have a significant amount of capital um, because of my idea. My idea is going to be this. They're going to bankroll you on the purchases and they're going to bankroll you on the renovations. And you're going to pay them a flat rate of return on their money while they're in the deal. So let's just say they put up I don't know, I'll make up a number, $300,000. And that's going to buy the property and it's going to renovate the property all with your team, okay? You're going to get in, you're going to build it out, you're going to do the work, you're going to get the property cash flowing and you're going to refinance it. And during the refi, you're going to give them 
hopefully all their money back. Okay. Yeah. They get a foothold in that property. It could be 15, 20%. So they've now got all their money back and they've got 20% of that new deal and they become your funder of, of every new project. Maybe you don't even have to pay them an interest rate. Maybe you just pay them the, with the equity, but they bankroll you on deals that enables you to scale and buy a lot more smaller units like that. That's what I would do. So, you know, it's the burr strategy we talk about on bigger right. pockets all the time. Here, here's what I like about that. Um, and, and I'll jump in because what Matt's talking about is t staying in your lane and, and, and emphasizing what you're good at and, and what you've done. And so your track record is to pick up these properties around Maine and, you know, you transitioned a, a very successful business into now a very successful portfolio and you're sort of, you're running over everyone, right? You've got the next 15, 20 unit property, 12 unit property, all those you know, small, mid-sized multifamilies and you're crushing it. So you can attract money because you are that guy in that space. If you are going to say, oh, and the next thing is the next $5 million, $10 million property, um, that's not in your space. And I'm not at all saying that you can't do it and that you can get there and partner with the right people 100%. But if you can lean into what you are good at and what you know you're doing, there's there's no question it, for someone to write you a check because I can look at the last deal and the deal before and the deal before and the deal before and see all this history and all the success that you've had, then I'm gonna feel really good about writing you that 300,000, half a million dollar, million dollar check, whatever you need, because I know you've done it and I, and I know that you're, you're gonna do it again. Great, there, great. You this know, like Preston, next level, he, man. That's good stuff, man. Yeah. But what I, what I get out of it is that there are so many different ways to invest in real estate. And so many people think that buying an apartment building is the way to do it right now. That's what you have to do. And if you're mm -hmm. buying, if you're buying rentals, you should scale up and target buying apartment buildings. Um, and a lot for that's the path for a lot of people. It was the path for you and me. Um, it made sense for us because we wanted to business size this thing. And I had attracted a lot of capital because of this, you know, because of this guy. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and that, and just because we were scaling and businessizing our company, but it doesn't mean that that's the only way to make money in this business. Absolutely. I mean, yeah. you've got the king of mid-sized multi in Maine. I mean, come on, let's brand it, Gene. Let's go. Yeah. You've got a podcast here and everything. Yeah. I see the whole Maine multifamily. I love it. And yeah. the Maine multifamily. Maine mid-sized multifamily. How about yeah. that? I love it. I love it. I love so, it. So Gene's the king over there. So Gene is the king. Um, uh, listen, great lean show. in for me. It's about leaning into what you're good at, what you enjoy doing, what you know. Um, and that's not to say you don't want to evolve and grow, uh, but sometimes, uh, maximizing what you have and, and scaling that out, uh, will lead you to the success that you need. Yeah. I agree. So. I agree. Great show. Um, yeah. cool. Thank you guys for watching one more time, man. I can't say it enough. Help me at derosagroup.com. Come join us on the show. Come have these awesome conversations with Justin and I. Uh, it's fulfilling for us too. And it's great fulfilling for our audience. Thank you guys for leaving your quiet, your comments. Justin, what do we got? Want to bring it home with me? That's it. Cool. Thanks Ready? for watching, Let's guys. Go. Have a great, great profitable week. week. <laughs>